if this was said by any other prime minister, there will be riots and protests on the streets. Don't have to go far. If he was leader in opposition today, today he was the leader of opposition. Hmm. Let's be very honest and sincere. Do you think that the reaction would be the same? BFM 89.9, I'm Philip C and this is The Breakfast Grill. Now today in the studio with me, I have the pleasure of speaking to Syed Sadiq, Moa MP and President of MUDA. Uh, very good morning, YB. Welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Good morning. Really appreciate your pleasure to come here in view that you've been really incredibly busy in the past one week. I mean, uh, just another week in Parliament. That's a more exciting and interesting week. I think it was more than just one week for you, I have to say. I mean, because you really made a momentous decision to pull out from the PHBN, uh, um, Madani Unity Government or whatever uh, nomenclature we call this now. But I guess the question is, when you decide to pull out from this, are you fundamentally supporting a dissolution of this government then? No, I think it's uh, very different. I've already given my firm commitment that uh, even though the government has lost its two-thirds majority, Mm. Um, I want to ensure that uh, if there are good progressive uh, constitutional reforms which are put on the table, I'll be the first to support it. Mm. This is in terms of citizenship laws. This is uh, in terms of decentralization of power, more checks and balances. Absolutely no problem to support. Um, Case in point, even when I was serving as a minister, despite the PH government in 2018 not having two-thirds majority, we still uh, were successful in securing three different bipartisan constitutional uh, amendments. So um, in the end, I just want to ensure that a clear wake-up call is sent because my greatest fear is that no one speaks up, no one stands up. This will just be a beginning for many more criminal corruption Mm -hmm. charges to be dropped and the beginning of the normalisation of corruption in Malaysia. I mean, I think the issue here, as I listen to you, is you have no issues with supporting Ah. specific policies, right? But it's just that the political structure here, in your view, is pretty reprehensible with respect to the coalition there. I... For me, then it is very hard, right? Because you're kind of dis- distinguishing, dis- you're kind of distinguishing the politician versus the policy here. Yeah. I wonder then, in this case, let's say um, the case of Datu Sri Zahid basically exiting the party, then Amno, um, would you then lend back your support to this coalition hypothetically? See, it's nothing personal against Datu Sri Zahid, mm. and at the same time, even Amno. Um, to be fair, I was also there at the beginning of the formation of this uh, unity government and we understood the need to work with AMNO, But there was absolutely no deal to drop criminal charges. What more for political convenience? And the argument that ah, this is real politic, it must be done, if not the government will collapse, is just a blatant lie. This is not the same situation mm. like what the former prime minister or former former prime minister faced where they came in with a razor-thin majority where three MPs living could lead to the collapse of the government. The government today has two-thirds majority, 148 majority. The previous two prime ministers only had 113, 115 MPs. The disparity is huge. Yet, they did not drop criminal charges. I mean, against Datuk Sri Zahid. And today, I mean, what was a clear red line? And let's not forget, like in 2018, we campaigned against 1MDB. In 2022... The campaign was on Datuk Sri Zahid. I never once in my campaign speech said that if I win, I would put Datuk Sri Zahid behind bars. I said I will respect the rule of law and allow for the court to take its course without political interference. Those today who are justifying, legitimizing mm. the dropping of the cases are the ones who said, menang hari ini, esok masuk penjara. I mean, the hypocrisy is unbelievable. Yeah. But, but put that aside, right? I mean, in the end, what I want is a robust system in which follows the rule of law so that in the end, it doesn't... Uh, while it started with Datuk Sri Zahid, my fear is that it will continue many more unless clearly the people speak up so that Datuk Sri Anwar and the government knows that they cannot take the voice of the people lightly. In your view, right, what do you think Datuk Sri Anwar should have done right to have made sure that this did not happen right with respect to the DNA with Datuk Sri Zahid? What is it that he could have intervened to make sure that this didn't do happen? Do not intervene and follow the rule of law. Mm. I know. And did he basically demonstrate that he did not follow the rule of law? Yes, because in this part, I just want to say a few things. This is not a typical case where you can just say, oh, no, no, actually, I didn't interfere. This is all the AG doing it. And I hear this excuse, oh, it was Tan Sri Mudin who appointed AG. I mean, let's not beat around the bush. It was Datuk Sri Anwar who said last year that he was denied the Prime Minister's position because he didn't want to kowtow 
to the kleptocrats who demanded for the cases to be dropped. He said it, not me. Fast forward after elections, he paired up with the alleged kleptocrat. Above and beyond that, made him the deputy prime minister. Then cases were indefinitely postponed. The public prosecutor who successfully secured a prima facie case dropped and went into early retirement. And in between this grey transition of when the former AG was about to leave, who he extended, you can't keep on blaming the previous government, who he extended, and before the new AG came in, all 47 corruption criminal charges were dropped. But not just that, sir. After being probed by the media many times, the Prime Minister himself admitted that the AG went to see him many times to discuss about the case, mm. when is the right timeline, what is the reason. And everyone knows that the AG who he extended and the AGC is placed under the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister's institution. I mean, I just saw another interview, I think, where he spoke in Singapore, where he just, oh, yeah, yeah, the AG came to see me, this happened. He was very blasé about it. That's yeah. your frustration. I mean, come on. If this was said by any other Prime Minister, there will be riots and protests on the streets. Do you have to go far? If he was leader in opposition today, today, he was the leader of opposition, hmm. Let's be very honest and sincere. Do you think that the reaction would be the same? I think there will already be protests on the streets. Parliament would be like, man, <laughs> there will be huge fights. But yet today you hear utter silence. Not from me. Yeah, I mean, I think what's very interesting is, you know, I, I, I hear your case and it's very loud and clear. But, you know, you, if I see my even WhatsApp board, it's being littered by so many questions, right? Questions being asked about whether or not... Uh, you are you're making this case because of your current corruption and criminal cases against you, right? So questions about Ask Sadiq, what will happen and what will be his reaction if he is granted a DNAA? Will he refuse it as he will have to say no over it, right? Also another question from another person, Joni. What is the story on the missing money in your home? So I think the 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 just a position here is really you made a stand with respect to anti corruption. Does that apply to you as well? Hundred and ten percent. You know, if I wanted an easy way out since 2020, I would have just maintained my post as a minister or even when I rejected the ministerial position to take up the offered GLC positions. Mm -hmm. Heck, I would still be in Basatu, Youth Chief, comfortable position. Instead, I fought and when the offers were rejected, came the threats, I continued to fight, right? And uh, I think that says a lot. Above and beyond that, I want to answer the very specific question. What if I were offered the DNA? I cannot be offered because I never once sent that representation letter Above and beyond that, I never once asked for my case to be postponed. To, for someone to ask for the update about my case, Dato Sri Zai took four years. For me, it took less than one year, almost half a year. It started, I think, about July, August last year. We finished it completely by April this year, and now it's been the fifth month before waiting for a decision. I do not fear the hand of justice. Berani kerana benar. I never once, and this one, uh, differentiate. I never once asked for my prosecutor to be dropped, for the case to be postponed, and for my case to be dropped. I want to win in the court of law. I want to clear my name mm. because I believe that the hand of justice which is applied to any other citizen should also apply to me. But do you believe you're a victim of selective prosecution? Yes, but the best way to answer that selective prosecution is to bring it up in court. I mean... I was reading uh, one of the justification used about selective prosecution, but you've passed the point of prima facie, including mm. me. Present it to the judge, and if the judge sees it as a reasonable ground, then the judge will give a good judgment, right, for or against. I mean, for my case, and I can see it because it is in court, this is not about like, oh, just someone comes and see me and says this and that. For me, the own MACC officer, <laughs> right before I was charged, asking about statutory declarations, supporting the previous Prime Minister. But I brought this up in court mm. and allow for the judge to hear it himself with the audio clip. That's the difference. I do not want to be treated differently from the average Malaysian because the last thing which I want is to be a hypocrite. I mm. want for Malaysia to follow the rule of law. Yeah, I think what you push for is for some, you know, institutional justice that we can put in place. I think many people are just kind of worried, though, that in this day and age, there is a huge need for some stability in government. And you tried to address it just now by saying, look, this government has a resounding yeah. truth majority. But there are, of course, valid concerns about its stability. But the biggest, con you know, criticism we get a lot is that you seem to paint a harsher picture on the PHB and government versus on Perikadan National. Mm -hmm. that there's an assumption that 
in ruling party, you have to be whiter than mm. white. Are you being unfair in terms of your criticism towards the ruling government? Yeah, I mean, um, I see I see a lot of um, PH Shaitro saying, ah, where was Sadiq during PN's government's uh, mishaps? Yeah. I mean, seriously, guys. I mean, I fought so hard that I was expelled from my party. Got me and my family dragged to court because I was so vocal and I was in the front lines. I mean, uh, when whichever cases were dropped, <laughs> I mean, there are receipts uh, on social media and as reported widely by the media, I was organizing protests uh, nonstop. Uh, so, I mean, on that, I think my, my track record speak for itself. But there is a clear distinction here. The other two prime ministers did not drop those cases despite being pressured to a point that they could even lose their prime ministership. And one capitulated and in the end allowed for early general elections. I would have thought that a reformist for decades with their identity would not drop. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think Dan Shri Mide and Dan Shri Mide and say, oh, they are reformists. Huh? I never thought that, this, that it would go this far. And for me to do nothing... I would be the biggest hypocrite. You know why? Because in 2020, when Sheraton happened, I fought against Sheraton to a point that I was expelled and threatened because I was against this exact line. I thought that working with Amro then would lead to criminal cases being dropped. And that line was at publicly. I said, it is wrong. Today, if I suddenly keep quiet because there's a different prime minister in power and because I'm comfortable, wouldn't that make me the biggest hypocrite? In reality, I'm just staying consistent to my platform. It is not about political convenience because my greatest fear is that if nothing happens, I mean, just imagine what message this would send to young leaders, young politicians, including young members of Malaysia. It effectively sends a message that you can still, to the tunes of hundreds of millions of ringgit, forget about good public policies, building of infrastructure, schools, hospitals. But when you are caught, you are dragged to court, delayed. Four or five years, even though more than 100 witnesses have been called, prima facie form, mm. thousands of documentation proof, a little bit more. And in the end, you just use your political leverage to negotiate your way out. I sense the frustration. I guess the question also then is, how hard have you tried to change within the system? Because you have been in power before. You have been a minister. You know, you, it's very easy from an outside in to, you know, level this criticism. I think, of course, you exit because you were in the throes, but you also struggle to work within the system, right? Within even both PHB and Embrasatu. It is hard to move these elephants then? I mean, negotiations are never easy, but I never knew that negotiations go as far as uh, drop my criminal cases, despite the fact that it's coming to an end and about to arrive to a decision. Negotiations are about policies. Negotiations mm. are about maybe uh, resolving power imbalances uh, among... Uh, uh, parties in government but it is not about uh, breaking the rule of law and ditching reforms for political convenience I mean and this is not like this is not like, like oh I want to pass a reform uh, but instead of presenting the bill this year it will be next year this is like something which they campaigned so hard about that it was in every single one of the campaign speech so, I mean, really think about it. Imagine in 2018, we campaigned hard against 1MDB and then after election, we say, hello, 1MDB, you are now a friend. You'll, make, you'll be made the Deputy Prime Minister. Above and beyond that, uh, we will forget everything. Imagine how Malaysians would feel then. Apply it today. And again, I just want to stress it time after time again. I do not think and will never think that just because of this compromise, or oh, suddenly the government will be more stable or if you don't do this, the government will collapse. That is not true. Said, earlier on we had a conversation with you about your motivations of exiting the PHB and Unity Government. Now let's turn our attention to the future about this creation of a third force. You're not making good progress, right, in building this third force? I think there is good progress. I mean, to put it simply, um, in the state elections, uh, which was remarkably tough and short, uh, under-resourced, underfunded, hmm. uh, in only about a month of campaigning, I think being able to breach that 5% threshold uh, in a very short time span while being underfunded is a decent beginning, especially the collaboration with PSM. Moving forward, I think we have about four years, uh, four years plus before the next general elections. I think a lot of things can happen and I have a firm belief that the pendulum will swing, especially when there is a viable option uh, to promote mm. a truly multiracial, moderate, reform-centred Malaysia which talk about policies. Um, so it will not be easy, undeniably. Um, however, um, 
I think I feel at home because I know my heart is in the right place. Mm. I mean, I just was reflecting exactly three years ago, you were here in the studio announcing yep. the formation of Muda. So it really is a bit of an anniversary for you to come back into the studio yep. here. But three years is a very long time in politics. Um, yeah. Progress has been slow now. I mean, let's not forget, <laughs> even though the announcement was made here, it took us an additional one year and a half before we got Muda registered. Mm. We didn't get registration by the minister or by the ROS. Uh, our birth certificate came from the court. So Muda effectively was uh, given out. life and birth uh, <laughs> from the amazing court. Yeah. Um, uh, so effectively, it's only been about a year and a half uh, mm. since we were fully registered. Um, and again, Malaysian politics is full of tribulations. I mean, problems, its own sets of barriers and challenges. Uh, however, I think with the right leadership, mindset, ideology uh, and uh, policy recommendations, I think uh, we will be able to fully distinguish ourselves as we move forward. Let's not forget it. the parties today have taken decades to build themselves. Decades. Um, at times it takes years before they even win their first seat. So we have a lot to learn when it comes to resilience and perseverance. Yeah, because I think you have to grow much faster, right? I mean, if you look at your base, correct me if I'm wrong, your membership's about 40 over 1,000 members so far. More or more now? That. Yeah, yeah um, it's about 100,000. Uh, full membership is about 60,000. Okay, so you've, yeah. you've grown from that from versus the website, which is at 40,000. Yeah. I guess then the question is, you need to ramp it up extremely fast, right? Yeah. And I think if you saw what happened in the PRN, the way you raised money also, it was through auctioning. Yeah. Paintings, otak otak. I yeah. mean, that's not sustainable to a certain mm. extent, right? I mean, we want ground, you know, support, but fundamentally, you need to restructure how you organize yourself, fund yourself, isn't it, in order to grow your membership? I mean, um, I still believe in crowdfunding being the main uh, tool of fundraising. Mm. Um, I mean, for the state elections, it was not easy. I mean, to put it into context, um, uh, funding of the nineteen seats. It's about equivalent to funding of only one Amno seat. <laughs> Actually, no, the funding of one Amno seat is more expensive than funding of all 19 seats. Mm. Uh, but that's okay. It's, it's a beginning for us. And it was a very short time span. We had one month then, only one month. Uh, and a lot of the candidates only had two weeks, right? Because it was very last minute. So now with the benefit of hindsight, there's a lot more to improve. And I completely agree with you. We need to have organ uh, uh, organizational discipline. We need to be more innovative and uh, forthcoming when, when it comes to fundraising and planning. I suspect the biggest post-mortem is that campaigning isn't a two-week process, isn't it? Oh, that is, I think, the definitely. biggest fallacy we should dismiss now. I mean, yeah. Perkata National did very, very well simply because the campaigning took place through a digital platform much earlier than that, right? But that requires you to invest now on the resources, right? Yeah. How are you going to build up the resources and the financial needs of this political party? I think one thing which um, I've learned, and even if you look at Perkata National, uh, uh, Prakata National. Uh, I see a lot of people say that uh, they'll just uh, fall and fail after they're out of government because they no longer have the largesse to fund yeah. their political machinery. However, however, we saw the exact opposite. They grew even more. They won uh, a lot of seats uh, which previously were untouchables in uh, state in, in in the recent state elections and made a lot of inroads during the two by elections. Um, what does that teach me? It shows that in the end, you need to have dedicated members who are unpaid but willing to post up videos, to write statements, to keep on being on the front lines every day because they're motivated by cause and reason. Because they know that this is an investment into the country, their future and their children's future. I think having that is a lot more worth it than merely having a huge largesse, but in the end, that pool gets smaller and smaller because you have to pay everyone. Mm. We cannot adapt, uh, we cannot follow the AMNO model of patronage. We need to create our own model which is more sustaining. Because the fact of the matter is, we will not get the amount of money like you other mainstream yeah. political parties. I mean, you won't. And maybe what your argument here is, you may not need it as well, yeah. right? Going Correct. forward. I think that's what your argument here is. But I think the more important question here is, can you build up the platform fast enough to sizably, you know, take a larger share or even win more seats? I mean, you didn't win any seats. Mm. You know, 15% of the funding you raised was mm. back to paying deposits. Mm. I think that, I think, is the lesson learned here, right? Yeah. How do you scale up your membership growth fast? Because the question here is, I feel that in this country, the political system is structured, as you said, binary, yeah. that people don't contemplate this idea of a third alternative. Okay, so to me... It's, it's an not... either-or situation, yeah. or an either-or, or... or. Yeah. To me, the messaging is most important. Why? Mm. I mean, you talk about membership. AMNO has 
the largest membership base, but yet they are one of the smallest parties in terms of mainstream party. Size doesn't matter. Yeah, DAP in terms mm. of membership is one of the lowest, yet they are the largest in parliament. Yeah, but it's about messaging, it's about building public trust with the average Malaysian and being viciously consistent on that. And even while there are compromises, you don't compromise on the main central message. So I think that matters a lot. And then organizational discipline for the next four years. So. Um, yeah, I think moving ahead, we definitely have to scale up very quickly. But it's about identification of leaders, getting them on the front lines every day and getting our stances out every day. And at the same time, training our members, the average member, to always uh, be prepared to either be as candidates or election machinery. But more importantly, to keep on talking about the consistent party messaging. Mm. Um, uh, and for myself, is to ensure that I can build this good uh, organisation to sustain for the next four years. So centrally, right, still the message is key. How do you create that consistent message? The worry is that the message that you convey now may not resonate, actually, with most people. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the argument, right? Because even if I just look at what people are saying mm. here on, on BFM, look, we really are focused about the economy. We've focused a lot on other bread and butter issues. Mm. And that what you talk about in the past, earlier segment, really is highfalutin, doesn't mm. really reflect what is the situation on the ground. It's idealistic, right? Mm. Utopia. That's the always accusation leveled on you yeah, you're I mean, utopian and idealistic i mean this, the, the 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 criticisms are fair and um i mean if i merely join politics to pander then uh i think i wouldn't be where i'm at today mm. uh, in the end it is about changing hearts and minds and changing hearts and minds will take time i think today while some would say so you're going to stick to the message yes then. i mean some some would say no no, no i mean uh, it is okay because if not the government will fall you shouldn't like rock the boat um you know it is okay it's just zahid but one thing which I learned, attitudes and perceptions change very quickly. Uh, and once they change, uh, I think people start to realise um, who speaks consistently, who speaks the truth. And I'm of the belief, again, that the pendulum will swing back, looking at what's happening today. I know some are saying, oh no, the focus is on the green wave. Well, I have a message that the green wave will be made much, much worse after this. Even though I don't think it's a green wave, I think it's a wave of dissatisfaction and anti-corruption it will be made much, much worse with the release of or the dropping of the criminal charges. Because if you look in the Middle East, what led to the collapse of, uh, uh, let's say, Husni Mubarak in Egypt and the rise of the, of the Islamists, it was corruption and incompetence. Look at Afghanistan, right? How did the Taliban take over from Hamid Karzai? It was corruption and incompetence. Today, what is happening in Malaysia is that the good guys and the reformists <laughs> are the ones cleaning up the corruption, but I say cleaning up <laughs> in Basu Common Suci, kan? which is by the dropping of charges and expecting that people will just forget and sing Kumbaya together. Well, I can tell you, even my middle class, super smart Malay friends are pissed. Mm. They are super pissed and the numbers show. The more you do this, the more you will lose support and you don't blame Islam, you blame the lack of principled politics. And that's my fear. And that's where Muda must bridge and be in the middle. Because if not, sir, I can tell you that the pendulum will swing and it will not be in the middle. The pendulum will swing the other way. And my fear Malaysia will crash. I do not want that to happen to our country. Welcome to this extended breakfast grill. With me in the studio today is Syed Sadiq Moore, MP and President of Muda, as we have a broad ranging conversation about the exit of Muda from the Parik. Pakatan Harapan oh, Barisan National Government. Ooh, that was a <laughs> mistype, mis misquote there. But you know, now, okay, you're alone, you're a lone ranger in Parliament. Yeah. I want to know what are your priorities in the next three years, assuming this government remains? I mean, um, to be the check and balance and the voice, con the voice of conscience of the people. Um, I think the government has uh, fallen back a lot on its reform agenda. I'm not talking about uh, breaking new grounds. Uh, I'm talking about basic things which have already been agreed upon. For example, uh, equal allocations to all uh, 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 parliament, regardless whether they're in government or opposition. Uh, asset they've declarations. They've uh, reneged on that? Yeah, they've reneged. Uh, Datuk mm. Sri Ismail Sabri, to his credit, gave equal allocations, 3.8 million to all uh, MPs, because the money is audited and goes straight to the constituent schools, uh, the underprivileged, but today it's 3.8 million to zero ringgit Malaysia. Asset declarations, I mean, it was done previously from 2018 and carried out by the uh, other governments. But yet today, I mean, it's been postponed, postponed and postponed. 
I do not know how many times you want to blame Amno for everything. Mm. And uh, if I were to keep on speaking, there's a list. A litany of, of lists. But I want to yeah. get your thoughts, right? When you think about the policies you're going to focus and champion on, do you put the lens of what the youth really are interested okay. to focus on? That's or right. are you taking a Malaysian issue and then amplifying it to the youth audience? I think it's to focus on Malaysia and Malaysia must always come first. Because I believe that youth issues are largely uh, interrelated to national issues. So mm. one core issue, obviously, is to build a Malaysia with strong institutions that no matter who becomes government, who controls Putrajaya, who sits as a prime minister, Malaysia will be on the right footing because institutions outlast political personalities and that can only come through decentralization of power. That's one. Second part behind it, obviously, is to ensure that we are economically strong. And for that to happen, we cannot just look simply at improving our uh, um, wage, to, uh, wage to GDP ratio. Yeah. We need to grow our economic pie and I think um, to, the ambitious aim of doubling uh, our GDP or at least the size of our economy in the next 10 years is ambitious but I think must be done through good policies and that must come through a lot more privatisation or private sector participation more data driven policy making uh, and less protectionism that means breaking up monopolies and concessions and making things to be a lot more competitive so that's one side uh, of things as well. Mm. And then another side is obviously on overhauling our education system where I feel very passionate about. Um, I mean, if you look today, we spend 20% of our GDP per capita on education, three times higher than Japan, almost twice higher than Singapore, yet um, our PISA rankings is even lower than Vietnam. Um, and I think yesterday I gave a three-point uh, solutions in parliament how we can revamp our education system from lower to higher education and including investing a lot more in micro credentials one very small example i mean just two days ago there was this viral video of um, this uh, food panda rider who got his motorbike taken away by the police actually the police was just doing their job but i see politicians okay well, let's give the person another motorbike or let's give uh, food uh, uh, let's give grab grab riders 500 ringgit a year cash and out say that doesn't move the needle what we need is, especially today when studies have shown more than 50% of SPM leavers don't want to further their studies. They want to work, not because they want to, but they have no choice, no money. Their parents do not have enough income. We need to ensure we have a 1 billion ringgit micro-credential fund so that when you can be a grab rider, earn a living, help your parents, but at night or weekends, you go to class and in six months' time, you get a proper micro-credential which will allow you to climb up the socioeconomic ladder. So, so I mean, you've been in government before, you have been youth and sports minister before. This is not an issue about allocation, right? This is an issue about execution, isn't Correct. it? Correct. So, so the yeah. question here really is that to do this, you have to shake up the bureaucracy of civil service, right? When you were in as a youth and sports minister, how difficult was it for you to make changes within your own ministry okay, then? In, in contrast to popular belief, to me, it was an absolute honour and pleasure to work hand in hand with the civil service. I mm. give a key point. People often uh, forget this, this this notion that there are a lot of great people in civil service. When I came in, I think... But, the concept, <clears throat> but they will say they have entrenched views, even though they are really people with good intentions. True, but you need to convince them. You have to work with them. You cannot just <clears throat> merely instruct and expect everything to move on its own without meticulously doing the follow-up. I give very simple examples. When I was working with the uh, civil service, I mean, these are some of the most hardworking people who previously, when we subcontract a lot of things outside, but when we gave it back to them to run it, my God, not only was the cost much, much lower, but it was run much, much better. But previously, they just said, I mean, for example, youth and sports, everything was passed outside to different subcontractors, but when it went back to them, they really felt, I mean, empowered. They knew they could do it. And until today, the same policies are kept. So I think it is a combination of both. Right? You need mm. to have a lot of private sector buy-in. I mean, again, if you are the, the Ministry of Economy, sure, but it's youth and sports, right? I mean, uh, um, so it must be a combination and a merger of both. If not, when there's too much politics, they feel underappreciated. They think that they must have direct links or networks to me in order for them to climb up, which is not right. So really, I was also quite lucky because um, when I came in, uh, the civil service <clears throat> under KBS was great. Uh, also because of my predecessor, uh, YB Kari Jamlude, I almost kept everyone who he appointed uh, from the KSU to TK, actually I kept all, KSU, TKSU, uh, Ketua Jabatan and uh, he had a solid team and uh, when I came in and he also did a great job as well. So when, 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 when I came in, I inherited a great team and mm. uh, I think that also reflects um, um, 
our good civil service. How do you think Hannah is doing as minister? I think Hannah is doing a good job. Mm. So you would support her policies then when moving forward, even Definitely. though you're not in government? Definitely. I mean, um, as I've shared before, good policies must be supported regardless of partisanship. Mm. I mean, while I may have strong, strong disagreements with stances taken by her party, uh, but does that mean that I'm blinded by good things done by good ministers? No. I think the question, though, when I listen to you, your key priorities being the economy and education, it is a strategic question of choice, right? Because on the education side, which is very much interlinked to the economy to a certain extent, the argument sometimes is that we have underemployment here, that people actually are skilled, but the opportunities are not fast you know, coming in fast and furious. The right ones are not right. coming in fast and furious. And that's why the government pushes for this moving the wage income as a percentage yeah. of GDP. But you said just now you don't agree with that target, yeah. right? Why do you not agree with that okay, target? Okay, I want to be very clear. It doesn't mean I disagree with the target, but I think mm. instead of only looking at that without planning it hit how to grow the economic pie would be a problem. Why? Just two very simple points, right? If you look at uh, wage uh, to GDP ratio, uh, it differs. Service sector, manufacturing sector. Manufacturing sector, which requires a lot more OPEX and CAPEX in particular, obviously then would fall behind when it comes to that ratio. Similar when you look at service sector, where it goes to the exact opposite in terms of wages, which would most likely be very higher despite the fact that CAPEX may be lower. That's one thing to consider. The second part to consider, if you only increase, for example, wages, but economic pie is small, in the end, the growth of our economy will be uh, small as well. So I think... It must go hand in hand. It cannot just be one over the other. Mm. The second point behind it, you can't blame young people when it comes to underemployment. I think the biggest problem in Malaysia is unemployment, not unemployment. Unemployment figures in Malaysia is about 3.3, 3.4. Youth unemployment is about 10.2%. Significantly lower than China and many other countries. However, today, I mean, why would you want to go to a university where it takes six years on average for you to get a degree with a student debt about 50 to 100,000 ringgit, but when you go in, the average pay for an engineer and architect is below 2,200 ringgit. Mm. Why? I mean, in reality, you can leave SPM, work in Uniqlo, you get paid 2,300 ringgit. Leave SPM, become a grab rider, you get you can get paid 3,000 ringgit. If you work overtime, can even go as high as 3,500 ringgit. It is a big problem. What are my solutions? I've shared before, TVET, start from high school, form three. You do that two years, immediately you get a diploma. Others may take the SPM route, you get a diploma. Once you finish, when you are 17 years old, go take a micro-credential, six months, eight months. Immediately, you join the, 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 the job sector with a diploma plus a, speci- a specialized micro-credential. In universities, trim the fat. In other countries, it takes four years to get a degree. Why does it take six years in Malaysia? So one. Other factors, we know that not everyone can enter universities. Again, empower micro-credentials. Not everyone have the financial largesse and parents having the saving to send their children to university. So a lot of them need to work and do want to take up micro-credentials so that they climb up the socioeconomic ladder. What I'm saying is not rocket science. I'm following success stories in developed countries and these are policies backed by data. So to tie it all up together, I envision a Malaysia in which the economy is highly competitive, uh, having uh, good policies in which embrace uh, open market economy while ensuring, I mean, the word to use is, is uh, it's not unfettered capitalism, it's fettered capitalism, mm. right? Proper checks and regulations. Um, because the last thing which you want, again, is to shrink the economic pie. Um, but again, be very happy by saying, ha, ah, actually, uh, our labor or wage to GDP ratio is better. So that's one. But to do that, you need a lot of uh, yep. political will to break up monopolies, concessions, opening up the economy and making sure that we transition. Uh, and, and on this, I need to give credit to Minister of Economy uh, and Minister Zafrol on the launching of NETR and also on the new Industrial Master Plan. I think more to discuss. And really, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. And don't be a stranger and join. don't join us in three years' time, right, after you form another party. <laughs> on The Breakfast Grill, Syed Sadiq, Moore MP and President Namuda. I'm Philip C, BFM 89.9.